everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. This week we are continuing on with the late 1830s Cinderella pink dress project and I thought that I was going to be really sneaky and do a few steps before filming even the intro for this video because they would all be really slow, pretty basic, and kind of just laborious hand sewing type tasks. And so what I have done so far since the end of the last video is that I seamed up the center front of the bodice with a strip of piping as well. And then I went and I put piping around the hem right here, which I will show you in a minute a quick tip about putting piping on the point of the hem because I did actually film that. And I put piping around the collar or the, around the neckline. Now I was doing this while watching Enchanted Rose costuming Marie her brand new video on her bell dress, which is a late 1820s bell dress, where she's talking about doing the whole front of the bodice and doing all the decoration and then assembling it with the rest of the pieces, including this ruched piece right here. And at that point it dawned on me, uh, shoot, I need to do a Bertha type item, not the same as hers, but this does call for a white Bertha to make that white strappy look of the Cinderella dress. And I was supposed to put that on around the neckline. And really it makes the most sense to do that before you do the piping on the neckline that, you know, I already did. And also on top of that, once I put the piping on the neckline and the waist, I realized I didn't have enough pink piping to do the arm size. So I went and I made more piping and then realized that the piping around the neckline because of the white Bertha, it would be white piping because otherwise I'd have a band of pink above the white Bertha. So, <laughs> whoops, yeah. Um, I got some stuff to do. Sometimes, maybe this is just me, but I feel like it's not because then Marika later went on in her video to describe something really similar, but sometimes I feel like when I'm sewing, it's very much like the if you give a mouse a cookie type situation where like, okay, so now I know I need the white piping and the white Bertha fabric, which generally speaking, that would be on the bias. So I know that I need bias out of my white fabric, but I also need the ruffle around the bottom of the skirt out of the white fabric. And I need to figure out how much ruffle section I need before I can cut bias because bias would wind up cutting that. I'm doing the ruffle lengthwise with the grain and so like I can't just cut into that or I'd have random holes or random cuts in my ruffle. So that then means that I need to figure out how much of the white fabric I need for the ruffle. <laughs> and so then I went and I did some scale measurements and I looked at the scale of the original Cinderella dress plus the scale of the fashion plate that I'm using as my main basis to try to determine how deep that white ruffle should be. And the fashion plate told me it should be about like 12 and a half inches, whereas the Cinderella ruffle, the scale would wind up being about 16 and a third inches. So there's a big difference. So I took my ruler and I looked at how much that would actually be on my skirt and determined honestly that splitting the difference and putting it at about 14 inches wide is probably the best bet. Now, all of that said, I can't actually put the ruffle on the dress yet because the dress isn't hemmed. And I can't hem the dress yet because the skirt isn't attached to the bodice. So, it's a whole chain reaction of things. But what I've determined is that the first thing that I should do now at this point, where I was going to have a lovely night doing hand sewing of the piping and everything on the bodice, I still can do that for the bottom of the waist and the arm size once I put the pink piping on there. But I also need to cut ruffles. So I am going to cut a 14 inch ruffle. The one thing though that I need to determine, I need to do a test of this first, is how I want to hem said ruffle. I have two options here. I did have a third, but I tested it and it doesn't work. The third option that doesn't work would be to use a narrow hem foot and try to do it that way. 
that doesn't work at all. I could not get it to work. And finally, when I could get a few inches of it to work, it wound up making the hem so stiff that it would just like stand out on its own and it look ridiculous. So my two other options are to fold a hem. Eh, I don't like that option because this poly matte satin does not really like to press. So that's not my favorite option. And there'd be a big old hem. Yes, I would be doing it by machine because I'm not crazy. This is made out of poly fabric. I'm not doing that by hand. I'll do a lot of other things by hand, not hemming ruffles. Or my other option is to do a rolled hem on my serger. I've got a baby lock serger. Those do really, really fantastic rolled hems. So that is a possibility as well. So I need to test both of those on a little scrap of the white fabric. And yeah, and then decide, well, if I have the folded hem, then I need to cut it deeper. If I have the rolled hem on the serger, then it can just be 14 inches. I don't need any extra seam allowance on the top either because it's gonna be hidden under the swags of light pink that will go across my dress. By the way, if you uh, haven't seen my plans for this dress or anything like that, if you haven't seen the first video on this project, you might want to check that out now that I am deep into this, what I am doing this week. So I will link that up above and down below in the description for you. And I will also link a playlist of everyone's historical Disney costumes also down in the playlist so that you can check all of those videos out there are a ton of different costumers making historical Disney costumes right now. And I just think that is super awesome because if you have been around my channel at all, you know that's a thing that I do. I have made an Elsa costume and I have made a Governor Ratcliffe costume, both just in 2020 as well as others. So right up my alley. So anyway, on my plans for tonight, I am going to pipe the arms eyes. Well, I'm gonna remove this piping from the neckline and put it on the arm size as well as the piping that I've just made. And hopefully, probably you do the hand turning and pressing of the hem because at that point I could start to put on the skirt if I wanted to. I don't really want to because I don't want to put the skirt on until I do the sleeves, so there's more steps there. But I also want to do my tests for the ruffle and the white ruffle and to ideally cut the ruffle. I'm pretty certain, I don't remember how much yardage I got of this, but I think it was like two or three yards. And I'm fairly certain that I'm going to need at least two panels of the 14 inch ruffle. So the whole length of that fabric of the 14 inch ruffle. So I'm pretty sure that's how it's gonna be. What my plan to do with this ruffle is just to run it through my ruffler foot but at every bow intersection that I decide to do, I'm going to fold those pleats up extra and potentially do maybe even a box pleat, but I want a little bit more depth because that's a lot of times how her dress winds up looking. She's got a little bit of extra pleating going on there at those ruffles. So I have a lot to do. I accidentally dressed to match my dress project. This wasn't on purpose and I am going to get to it. I want to quickly mention a little piping trick here. This is the center front point of the bodice and I'm here piping the hem of the bottom of the bodice. And what's going on here is I've reached this point and so what I need to do to make sure the piping goes around the point is to make a little cut there while I'm sewing. So I have sewn all of this down already and I got exactly to the midpoint halfway through this line of piping right here and then I backstitched and cut the thread off and took it away from the machine. Then I went and looked at, okay, where does that pivot point need to be to make the point right at the center? And I cut just a little snip there. And now I can start again and it'll just be like this. And it looks like it's sticking its tongue out or something. And now I can start sewing this way, but this way when I go to turn it on the inside, now granted I do have a lot to cut out of here, like as far as this excess seam allowance, but when I go to turn it, I can make that nice sharp point like that and get that turn there once I cut all of that excess off. So remember all that excess that was just on there? I have cut pretty much all that away. I could cut even a little bit more right there. Cut it all away. And so now I'm still not going to be able to do this very well with one hand. But now that will all fold in pretty nicely. And I will be able to press that and stitch that down. So this is where I'm struggling with my decision a bit. I have done a little test section here of the folded hem, and then I have also done the test section of the rolled hem on the serger. 
And you can see how nice and clean that rolled hem is, but it still just doesn't look as clean and crisp as a folded hem like that. So the one thing though with this folded hem, maybe you can see a little bit, it's doing this kind of weird tensiony thing. And I thought maybe it was a matter of how the thread was feeding, because I had it feeding from a stand. And then also uh, that my needle was old. And so this section was done first and it has that little bit of ripple. And then I did this one with a new needle and also with the thread in a different feeding system and like on top of the machine and it just feels just as bad so I don't know but it does look much much sharper and so unfortunately I think I'm going to have to go with this one <laughs> the unfortunate thing is of course that this does take way longer to do because I have to press it and then pin it because it is poly and it does not stay pressed at all which I've been noticing that with the bodice too like the bodice does not stay pressed it just is refusing to so this is the problem with me working with cheap fabric also this sheen kind of bothers me there's way more sheen on the white than there is on the pink like this almost feels like a not matte satin but whatever it's what I have it was what was cheap this is a costume I need to get over it and you know that's what happens when you buy fabric that's like five or six bucks a yard it just looks like this so we'll go back to nice fabrics for future projects but not for this one Anyway, I guess this is what it's going to be, so I'm going to measure how much room this hem takes up, which I think it's approximately a 3 8 inch hem or a quarter inch hem or maybe somewhere in between that. So I will add that onto the 14 and then cut that strip out or really those strips out to make into the ruffle. Now that I have two of these panels, really long panels, hemmed at the bottom, it is time to go through and do the ruffler foot. Now first, before deciding on what ruffler foot settings to do, I did do some test pieces. So I guess I should say, before even looking at test pieces, if you have or are considering getting a ruffler foot, I highly recommend making yourself a sort of key, a sampler, if you will, of your ruffler foot. So writing down the settings that you put on here, I really should have written stitch length as well, but I think I did this on just a 2.5 stitch length. But I wrote down all my settings, like 12.4, 6.4, 8.4, 6, 2, etc. so that you can see the gauge of the ruffles or like this section which is 1, 2, super super dense ruffles or the sections that are really a little bit more like pleats like 12, 8 and then I did several samples for this go around of just grabbing some of the poly matte satin and running it through on different settings so I think this one was the 12, 4 or 12, 8 setting and I did a few others too that have seemed to have disappeared. But I tried three or four different settings and finally decided that what I liked best was a five stitch length, five millimeter stitch length, and setting my ruffler foot on six and on eight down here. And so now I'm feeding that through. Let me show you what that looks like. A ruffler foot is not 100% precise, so there are little bits that will slip occasionally, and you might wind up with one that's irregular, but overall it is so much easier than doing this by hand. You want to make sure that your fabric is lined up all the way right in here to the edge of the foot and then it doesn't try to veer off or anything and you want to have slack behind the foot like this so that it doesn't pull because that will prevent it from creating a little pleat. the other side of the foot this is what it looks like I will probably just press the very top of this down but I won't worry about pressing it all the way down since this is a ruffle not a pleated section and the other thing is that I have not surged this top yet because I do find that if you surge it first there's a higher chance that the foot will get caught in the stitching of the surging so I'd rather just surge it after I have done all these plates so I am fairly positive that the two panels that I've pleated up for this is not going to be enough. However, I think that I'm pretty close to where I need to be. Basically measuring this out right now, I have exactly 14 inches extra 
than what goes all the way around. However, my plan, and I could just get rid of this idea, but my plan is that with Cinderella's dress, it's actually like a flat panel of white, except that at every bow intersection, there's some, I think they're multiple layered box pleats that are put right where that bow is. And so that was my idea too, that I want to put some box pleats in at every bow intersection. Now I don't know how many bow intersections I'm going to have. If I only have like five, like the original Cinderella dress, then I'm probably fine on how much I have already. But if I have one every five inches, then I obviously don't have enough of this ruffle. So what I'm gonna do though, I know that I don't need the full length for a whole, like one whole more row of this. I know I don't need that much. So that means that I think I can pretty comfortably cut the Bertha and the bias piping for this area <laughs> out of the rest of this and maybe just leave, you know, a, a 15 and 5 eighths inch swath kind of near the end so that I can get, say, from here to the bottom and make that into more of the ruffle. But like this end can all be Bertha because that's really it for the white. It's just the Bertha, the piping for the Bertha, and then the ruffle. Everything else that is decorative is light pink on her dress. I'm pretty sure. I will double check, but I'm pretty sure. And that means that I've got a lot of this left. Now, this is also supposed to be for the 1950s version, including the ruffle, but it's white matte satin. I can always get that from Joann's. It'll be more expensive, but like, if I don't have enough of this for that, I can go get more. It's not like it's hard to find. It's not like it's pink matte satin. Anyway, so I am going to start draping around and figure out how to get the Bertha. Berthas are basically my least favorite thing because I have yet to find a way to make Bertha's easy. To me, Bertha's are always difficult. They always involve draping. They always involve pleating random bits and it's annoying and I know it's going to be annoying in this poly fabric as well because this doesn't like to press. So I'm not really sure how this is going to work because normally I would just like press some pleats in on the bias and you know get this whole sort of thing going but look how bubbly and full that is that doesn't really want to do that. So it might mean that I need less of it. I don't really know but I'm going to play around with that probably off camera because it's just literally just me playing around with it and figuring it out and get that all sorted and then I can cut the bias strip for the piping as well. Also don't you like her hair? I have bought a few wigs on Amazon to see what I like best. Two of them have arrived. One of them is going back. Like I didn't even take it all the way out of the package because I could tell it was just the wrong color. But I think this one is going to be pretty close in color to what I need. This is a pretty nice wig. I can't remember how much it was, but I think it was like about 40-ish because that's normally what I spend for wigs. I don't go more than that. And it is a lace front style wig. And my goal is to, whichever wig I choose, to style it into like the puppy curl, droopy side curls right here of the late 1830s going into the 40s. And then probably sort of a bun in the back. I believe this is pretty close to my Aurora slash Dapper Rapunzel wig color. Like this is just a touch more yellow. And I'm pretty sure that I have some fake hair pieces like Yaki braids that match that. So I'm hoping that I have extra hair that I can maybe play around with. But this one is so soft, honestly. Like I, I'm pretty positive this is gonna be it because I think the other one's gonna be pretty close in color to the one I'm returning that I'm still waiting for. And I think this one is quite good. It's it's really, it's a good quality wig. I will link whichever wig I go with, but I'll link this one specifically down below for this video since I don't know if the other wig is supposed to get here this week or next week. But there will be wig styling in one of these future vlogs, maybe sooner rather than later because I keep feeling so kind of blah about this project. I don't know why. I think it's because the fabric choice, honestly, I think that poly fabric is just fighting me and it's not 
being very fun to work with and I also just got some other fabric that I purchased for another upcoming project and I really want to work on that upcoming project. So that being said, after I finish this, I'm not actually going to dive right into 1950s Cinderella. I know I promised that it will be coming and it still will be, but probably later this summer, not right away, because this is enough pink satin that I can handle for now. So I'm pretty sure my next project will be a history bounding related project in some lovely springtime gingham, because I don't know, it just speaks to me. So anyway, I am going to get to Bertha and figure some stuff out. So I think I have successfully pleated this first side. It actually didn't take me that long, which I was really surprised about. And the other thing that surprised me was even though I started it on the bias up here, it didn't really occur to me the fact that if I start it biasy here and then like pull it along something that's a diagonal, I would wind up on the straight. So this part here is I think kind of straight-ish and then not, I don't know, it curved a lot. But basically, I haven't pressed this or anything. I was just going around and like putting up little tucks and pinning it in place. What I did do here that maybe you can see is that I've stuffed foam down in her bust so that it would fully fill out this area because otherwise I have nothing to like hold it upright while I do that. So I think that worked. So the big question with me with Bertha's is always like once I get this first side, do I just cut around it and take the rest of the fabric and attempt to match it on the other side? Or do I actually cut around it, unpin it all, and use that as the template and then have to pin it all up again? So that's where I'm at right now, trying to decide what to do. I've done both ways and both of them suck. So if you know a better way of doing Bertha's than this, please do let me know because I hate Bertha's and I still have to do something in the back too. So I have one quarter of the Bertha pinned. I have pleated the second side. I decided to do it on the form, like leaving this one on the form and just eyeballing it. The one thing that I got slightly off, I know, is that I started this too far down from the shoulder. So this very end bit, like right here, doesn't actually make it to the shoulder seam. So that's really annoying because that means that like all of these pins are through the bodice and that means that I have to unpin them, put the pins just through the Bertha and then slide everything up about one inch or so. So I left a bunch of room down here that I can do that with, but the front is now done. So I, now I just have to do the back, but that'll be tomorrow. So good night. So as per usual, I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing with this Bertha. At this point I have two segments of Bertha for the front, and I have joined them together via a pin here. But the way that I've done this is that I've just folded over this side here and tucked the back underneath. So there's a whole bunch of extra ugh that I have to cut off. And it's like top pinned on top. So I was trying to figure out if there was a way that I could like open that seam up, but still have the pleats stay in place so that the right side matches the left side. And therefore I could just stitch them through on machine and be done with it. And I can't figure out a way to do that. So I have two options. I can either top stitch them by machine, which is fine, I guess, but I don't know. I don't love that idea. Or I could kind of top stitch or prick stitch them by hand or whip stitch them by hand, something by hand, which I suppose is another idea. I don't love either idea, honestly, but like, I don't know what else to do for it. So I'm going to have to do one of it because otherwise if I unpin them, everything's going to go haywire and I don't know what I'm going to wind up with, but it was a hard time to get the pleats to match anyway. I don't know what it is with Bertha's, but I hate Bertha's and it's because I never remember how to freaking make a Bertha. So every time I make a Bertha, which has happened multiple times, like this has got to be at least Bertha number three or four minimum. Every single time I am completely flying by the seat of my pants and I don't like that feeling and it winds up taking four freaking ever to do that. So if anyone has a good resource to like the perfect Bertha every time. Please drop it in the comments because I would like to learn that and not spend an entire week on a Bertha. Half a Bertha. This isn't even the back. I still don't know what I'm doing for the back. <sighs>
I hate Bertha's. So what I've done now is that I did wind up top stitching down this part right here on the machine and then just pressing to the side in the back. And no, they didn't wind up matching anyway on here because when the machine got to the place where the plates were, it pushed the pleat and squidged it and now they don't match. But you know what? I don't care. I'm gonna cover this with a freaking giant bow. And I hate Bertha so much, I don't care. So the other things that I did were that I cut off the excess on the bottom and folded up the hem and pinned that in place. That'll get like hand stitched in place. And I also basted by machine on the two ends. It's probably not enough to hold the pleats in place. I'm sure that I will have to take lots of weird tiny random stitches somewhere throughout there by hand and whatever. If that's If that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do. But you know what I realized? So I was working on this because I wanted to put the sleeves on, but I had already started pinning this on the form, on the bodice, and I was like, well, I can't put the sleeves on now because there's 500,000 pins in there, so I guess I have to do this whole freaking Bertha and then do the sleeves. But you know what? I took this off of the bodice, so the bodice is now accessible to do sleeves, and as much as I might hate fitted sleeves, which is exactly what I have to do with this, I hate Bertha's 500,000 times more than I hate fitted sleeves. So you know what, Bertha? Time to work on sleeves. So I found somewhere in my pattern stash, which desperately needs to be organized, and by pattern stash I mean patterns that I have drafted as opposed to my commercial patterns which are all like superbly organized, but anything that I've drafted and have in like mock-up form or whatever with labels on it is basically just put in an old Joann's bag, one of those reusable ones, as like this giant pile, and it's bad and I need to find a better way to organize it. So I went through there and I found my sleeves. I have several different things that are marked various types of sleeves. This one said fitted sleeve pattern elbow length, and since I want a sleeve that is just a little past my elbow, maybe about two inches past my elbow, I figured this would be a good starting point. Now, I don't think that this sleeve itself is going to be the correct sleeve for this project. For one thing, I measured the entire like measurement of what would go into the arm's eye, and it's about 24 something. I can't remember the exact amount now, but it was like 24.75 inches, I think, around. Whereas I measured the actual arm's eye, and it is 21.75 inches around. So obviously there's a disconnect there, because you want like up to about an inch of ease, but not like three inches. But I think that most of that is going to get resolved in the fact that this has a really high rise of the shoulder right now. So this is the part that goes right here. And it's really, really high. And this type of bodice is quite a bit off the shoulder. The shoulder line sits more like right about here. So I think just by decreasing the rise of the sleeve, that will kind of eliminate all of the excess that I have with this sleeve pattern. So that said, I am going to start by just using this sleeve pattern. That's the nice thing about having patterns that are on fabric. You can literally just use this as your mock-up. I don't have to cut something new. I'm gonna start by just using this and seeing how it fits into the arm's eye. Now again, my guess is that I will wind up coming down quite a bit, maybe to about here, and making that the slope, but I don't really want to start with that from the get-go because I wanna see just how far off I am. So I'm gonna do this part first. I also do have a note on here that this needed to get a little bit larger here down at the hem. And of course my sleeve is going to wind up being longer as well because this said it's an elbow length sleeve and I want my sleeve to go to about there. So we'll have to add on a little bit there. So some work to do, but at least I've got a starting point. All right, I do not have my corset on, so this does not fit me at all right now, but the sleeve is not bad. I decided to forego going right at the edge because I knew that was just so, so far off. So I have actually already ran the gathering stitch, I think like two or two and a half inches down from the apex of that sleeve pattern that I was showing you before, the sleeve kind of mock-up pattern. So it is like the rest of the sleeve is up here somewhere and I'm just not using it and it still is winding up being a little bit gathered here. I don't hate it, and it's gonna be covered by both the Bertha and some lace, so like, 
I could get away with just doing that and it would be fine. So I am kind of tempted to do that, but I think I'm going to go ahead and do another mock-up where I'm kind of starting at this line and then I can take it down from there. That way I don't have all that excess up there. And I'll go ahead and add the extra length up there too, because I added in the half inch that my pattern had told me to put here and now it's like too big. So maybe I don't need that and I can just slim this down a little bit and add a few inches more. I guess it's more than two, honestly, because it should be hitting here, plus have room to turn a edge, so an extra half inch there for piping. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and get an actual mock-up out of this. Okay, we are back in the uncorseted bodice, which is just pinned with one pin in back, and I have sleeve mock-up part two on, or I don't know if this even counts as part two because the previous one wasn't technically a mock-up, and this one isn't now going to be a mock-up because it's going to be a sleeve lining because it works. So I think I am going to taper just a touch out of the bottom here just to get it a tiny bit more fitted. Maybe take out about mm, three quarters of an inch from like tapering from the elbow to the hem here just so that this hem is a little bit more fitted on my arm. But overall, I think we are pretty good here. There's still a little bit of gathering going on right here in the sleeve cap. Again, it doesn't really bother me that much because it's going to be covered in stuff and I'm not going to see it. Though the stuff is kind of like a question of how to get it covered in stuff because I have gotten some lace. I, I went to Joann's today and I purchased some lace because the sleeves have three tiers of lace on them. One here, either at the shoulder or at the bertha, which is the question, one about here-ish and then one at the hem, which speaking of which this hem is actually now a little bit long or rather it's a good length here in the back, but for some reason it's longer in the front. So this is about a half inch too long, including also taking the seam allowance off. So I'm going to chop that a little bit and taper that out so that it is this length still over here because that is good. So overall, pretty close. I can go ahead and use this as my lining and cut out the actual pink part of the sleeve and then figure out how to get the lace on. This is the lace that I purchased. And what this lace looks like originally is this. So it's got this top section and then sort of a little bit of beading lace and then the flat lace that hangs down below. But what I'm doing with it is I've taken off the top lace and the beading lace and it's going to be just the other part of the lace. And I've run a gathering stitch along the top of that so that I can gather it up to something a little bit more like this. So that's a little much gathered, but it'll be a little bit more like this. I bought eight yards of this, so hopefully that is enough for what I'm doing. It seems like way too much, but you never know. And that will wind up being a ruffle, a ruffle, and a ruffle. But I do have to figure out with the top ruffle, does it get built into the sleeve head? Like, do I actually set it in with the sleeve, which I'm kind of leaning towards no on that. Do I attach it to the Bertha and then taper it out so that it's shorter as it gets to the center? That's a possibility. Or do I just kind of sandwich it between the shoulder and the Bertha and no one's gonna see the top anyway because it's hidden under the Bertha. So I think what's gonna happen is I'm going to put the sleeve ruffle on the midpoint and the hem as I'm making the sleeve and then I'm going to wait. And when I finally feel up to facing the Bertha again, then I will figure out where that top lace goes, whether it is just putting it around the sleeve cap right there or whether it's actually attaching to the Bertha and tapering it out, having lace go across as well. I really don't know, and I am not gonna get to the Bertha this week, cause it's Saturday night, <laughs> So I am hoping that tonight I can finish the sleeve, make it pink, make it have piping at the hem, make the lace tiers right there. I guess I don't need piping at the hem, actually, cause no one's gonna see the hem, cause there's lace there, so. Make it have something at the hem, a finish at the hem, but I guess not, it doesn't need to be piping. I don't know, we'll see. And I'm gonna go get going on all that. Oh, I have the sleeves on now, but naturally by putting sleeves on, I now no longer have the range of motion that I had before to be able to pin the top of the back because that is what happens when you add sleeves and off the shoulder kind of things. The range of motion just 
is gone. So I believe the sleeves work. It's hard to tell because I can't get the bodice on all the way. And I mean, I don't even like have closures in the back. I was literally just pinning it and I'm not wearing corset or anything either, but they seem to work. So I think I'm just going to continue with the decorating of them. I'm worried that they got a little bit tight somehow down here at the bottom. And it's probably a matter of cotton versus now with the poly on top and the poly has no stretch to it. And the cotton had some stretch and that was what was giving me the extra room down here. Normally I would just go ahead and like take that seam out, but I already put the piping on. And so, you know what? I think I'm just gonna leave it and see if I hate it, then I will fix it down the road, even though I never really fix things after I do them. Like my 1890s tea gown that needs the collar to have that tucked up bit, still hanging right behind the camera here, waiting for me to fix that. I'm really bad about fixing things once I finish them. Anyway, so I'm going to leave it as is. I think it'll be fine. And I am going to probably see about putting some lace on tonight. And that'll probably be it. So I will see you in a few for an outro. All right. I think I have figured out the lace placement. It's funny. The original fashion plate had the second row of lace like way up here, right at the bottom of the first. And then my drawing originally had the lace about here midway. But you know, what I settled on, and I tried a couple different things, was to have both laces down farther towards the bottom. And I think that it just balances better. I think because there's a lot going on up here, having the lace down there balances better. What I did do though, this is actually up quite a bit from where the bottom piping is. So it's probably good that I did fancy piping because I put this up so that it's like right through the middle of the motif where the piping would hit. And I do like where that sits on my arm a lot better. So now the thing is to mark where that goes and sew that on probably by machine. If I can get the machine, if I can get this over the free arm to the machine, which I think I can, then I'll do that by machine. And then also I have decided this is what I'm going to do for the Bertha lace. So it is going to taper in like that. So I think that all of this is pretty good. It's going to be a bunch of work. And honestly, it is getting late tonight. So I don't think I'm going to do it tonight. So... That means that this is where this project is going to be for the end of this vlog. And I know that this looks rather atrocious as like an end vlog thing because we really didn't get much done. But you know what? Sometimes this happens. And worse yet is the fact that I probably won't be sharing another Cinderella vlog with you for a couple of weeks because I have another project that I started a day ago and I want to finish. And so that is going to be the next video up because I'm just feeling so much more motivated by that project than I am by this one right now because this one's just been kind of a headache and especially considering I'm gonna have to work more on the Bertha. So next week for my vlog, you will be seeing, assuming that I finish it of course, a fun history bounding project that will hopefully be a relatively easy project to do and I'm really excited to incorporate into my regular day-to-day -day wardrobe. I feel like I haven't added anything to my wardrobe in a long time, probably since I made these skirts around Christmas time, so I'm overdue. Also, my parents are coming into town next week, so I am going to be spending time with them instead of necessarily working on Cinderella because I have not seen my mom in over six months and I haven't seen my dad in like 15 or 16 months because they live in California and obviously coronavirus has been a thing. So I'm super, super excited that we are all now vaccinated and we get to finally spend some time together. But that does mean that I won't be spending that time with you slash sewing. I do hope to have videos out every week and to not like have a break in my stuff. So I might give you kind of an easy interim video, but this one's going to wait for a little while. So if you do want to check in on progress, it's entirely possible that I may put some updates on Instagram because I probably will finish the sleeves before they get here. So I might very well be posting pictures on Instagram. So do be sure to follow me on Instagram. It's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. 
And if you liked this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. While I post videos twice here on YouTube with my sewing vlogs like this on Tuesdays and other costuming content on Saturdays, I do post daily over on my Instagram. So definitely do go check that out for sneak peeks and for other fun costuming related content. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi account down below in the description. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my Edwardian level patrons, Heidi, Mia Q, and Sharon. Thank you all so much for joining me for this week. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing! Okay, this looks really funny without my corset in on. It's just like this ridge because my bust is in a totally different place when I'm not wearing my corset. My bust should be up here. Uh, Regency corsets really lift, don't they?